Welcome to the uh, next session, the afternoon session, uh, and uh, it's going to feature a, um, a paper that was uh, circulated at the Palazzo Mondel in uh, Italy a few months ago. Um, around a year ago, um, the professor spoke at the CMRE in New York, the Committee, uh, Committee for Monetary Reform and Education. It's a very prestigious group. John Exeter was there. Hugo the Price has been at, at different times. I mean, they weren't there this time. Mr. Exeter passed away. But over the years, it's been a uh, very, very prestigious group of people interested in monetary matters. And he was invited to speak last year, and, uh, and he did. And as a result of that address, um, Robert Mundell, the Nobel Prize winner, invited the professor to the, his annual uh, roundtable meeting of economists in Italy. Uh, which happened this summer. And uh, at that uh, group of prestigious uh, paper boys, <laughs> he <laughs> circulated this paper that he's going to present to us. And the professor said he got zero feedback, of which he's very proud. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. As uh, Daryl suggested, I am the cry in the wilderness. <laughs> no, no response. But what I described in this paper, which is by the way available on the internet, on my website, that there are two groups of articles. One is popular economic, economics and the other is scholarly economics and the scholarly group has only two or three papers and this is one of them so it's easy to find. Just don't go through the popular economics because that's a big list go straight to the scholarly economics. Now it's not all that scholarly because I start with a children's game on the seesaw. Now I assume everybody knows what the seesaw is. It's a, it's, it could be very simple, just a long rod with a fulcrum in the middle and one child sits at one and the other sits at the other and, and they enjoy the seesaw. Now, what I'm suggesting to you, and this is accepted by all economists without exception, including mainstream Keynes, Friedman, everybody, that there is a rigid relationship between the rate of interest and the price of the bond. And this is an inverse relationship. But the emphasis is on the word rigid. It's as rigid as a seesaw. So if the rate of interest rises the bond price goes down, and if the rate of interest falls, the bond price goes up. And this is so sensitive that it acts within seconds. It's not a statistical relationship, it's a mathematical relationship, and there is no exception to it. So. Traders follow blindly if there is an announcement. That's, by the way, why they are watching like a hawk any announcement from the Fed or other central banks if the interest rate is going to be moved up or down because big money is to be made. This is like risk-free speculation. The central bank at the end of the trading day, say today, makes an announcement about its changing the rate of interest, 
Then you bet that next morning when trading of the bond starts, the predictable change in the bond price will take place. And of course, if you are the first one to act on that information, early bird gets the word. You will get the bigger profit. If you are late or lazy or haven't got that, that good an information, or if you haven't got inside information, then <laughs> too bad, <laughs> you won't get the word. <laughs> so, you see, this, is, this actually shows how dishonest the whole system is, because inside information we know very well is available, it's just a matter whether you are willing to pay the price for it. So, just have your mole in the central bank and you get the information maybe half an hour before the rest of the world and you got the profit, you can put it in your pocket. But my point is not this, this is just by the way. The main point is that without a question everybody accepts the thesis that there is a rigid inverse relationship between the rate of interest and the bond price. Now, let's play with this uh, thesis. Another way of formulating this, which I already put on the board, is that if the interest rate is falling, then the bond price is rising. Well, I'm just repeating it, specializing it, because I'm concentrating on falling interest rates in my presentation here. So, what is a bond? Well, the bond has two sides, depending whether you are a creditor or a debtor. From the point of view of the bondholder, who is the creditor, it may be good news, because it means the rising bond price is he has a paper profit, he could cash in if he sells. But from the point of view of the debtor, the issuer of the bond, it's very bad news because what it means is that the liquidation value of his debt is higher now than it was before the change in the rate of interest took place. Now, liquidation value of debt. They say this is a theoretical concept which has absolutely no consequence because why should you liquidate your debt? You want to go deeper in debt. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> so, believe it or not, believe it or not, no debtor today makes an adjustment for falling interest rate. They don't take any action. They just accept that it's a th for the birds. It's a theoretical concept that the liquidation value of the outstanding debt is now higher. But this is a very foolish behavior because you know very well that the liability of any entity, any economic entity, could be a bank, could be an enterprise producing consumer goods, could be uh, hedge funds, what have you, has to have a balance sheet. And the balance sheet has to represent reality. Not a fairy tale, but reality as it exists. So if interest rates have fallen, and the rise and the capital uh, and the uh, liquidation value of that rose, this has an effect. Even if you don't do anything about it, it will have an effect on your capital. Because the capital has been eaten away to the extent of this increase in the liquidation value of your debt. So another way of expressing this that capital ratios 
shrink as a consequence of falling interest. Now, the language of capital ratios is used mostly by banks because in the balance sheet of the banks there are various items of liability and various items of assets and you can take the ratio between one item in this column and uh, correspond and, and then other item, your choice, of the liability column. And, risk and uh, shrinking capital ratio <laughs> means for a bank that it's becoming more exposed to trouble. It's more exposed to a uh, credit crisis, a run, because there are people, whether you like it or not, out there who can read balance sheets. <laughs> not everybody. <laughs> But there are, and those who can, they will know that this bank is getting shakier and shakier. So in other words, if the interest rate falls, then the bank has to do one of two things. Either reduce assets, uh, either reduce liabilities, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> if, uh, the, uh, if the rate of interest falls, the capital ratio shrinks and the bank should restore the original capital ratio and he can do this by increasing capital which means that he can go to the uh, general public sell stocks but another way would be if the assets are reduced and that's not what is happening. The banks are actually increasing their assets. So this is a topsy-turvy world where they simply in, in, ignore the basic fact of accounting, which is that the capital has a meaning. It's not something for decorative purposes. It's it's the life line of a bank. Now that applies to banks, but exactly the same argument is applicable to all the other enterprises, factories, and so on and so forth, uh, agriculture. The bottom line is that if the rate of interest keeps falling for any extended period of time, then there is a, an erosion of capital. And this is happening simultaneously throughout the economic landscape. There is no exception to this. So if nothing is being done about this, then the day of reckon reckoning is approaching. And the day of reckoning is that almost simultaneously people will realize, the general public will realize that the emperor has no clothes, the bank has no capital left, it has been completely destroyed through that um, process of declining interest rates and it's too late to do anything about it. If it diagnosed early, if it is diagnosed early, then you can do something about it. As I said, you could, a bank could reduce its assets, <coughs> or issue new shares or even borrow, but that's very shaky. The point is that the accounting profession is ignoring it, the government is ignoring it, the individual banks and the individual enterprises are ignoring it, they just welcome the continuing fall of the rate of interest using the silly uh, argument that if you can borrow at a lower rate you are better off. Forgetting completely what Sandy pointed out in a different context, that if you can 
borrow today at a lower rate, that's not very good news for those who borrowed yesterday. Because it means that they financed their operation at the wrong rate. They should have waited a day. Or they, if, it's keep, if it keeps continuing, the fall in the rate of interest, they should stand back and wait until it runs its course. And then perhaps, analyzing the present situation, decide whether they want to make the investment after all. So in other words, it's a complete fool's paradise what we have here. That enjoy, enjoy the, the gravy train as long as it lasts because interest rates are falling, which is a welcome thing. Now, the, just, the, just the opposite, just the opposite. And it's really incredible that the accounting profession just doesn't, because that's what the purpose of accounting, of the accountants are. They should give you advance warning about the adequacy of capital, of enterprise. They are not doing that. They just go along with the herd and now, what I'm saying is that here we have a very vicious effect of erosion of capital, which is continuing, because in about 1981-82, interest rates peaked in the world. Uh, Short-term rates I have seen as high as, high as 22% in the 1980s. And now, as you all know, close to zero, if not at zero. So that's, and, and uh, more than 25 years uh, have passed in, in between. So we had a quarter of a century of capital erosion, global capital erosion in the world which nobody paid any attention. Now I have been saying this for about eight years in various papers. True, my first papers did not specifically uh, focus on the banks and the financial institutions because I thought that these guys had their hand in your pockets. Uh, you are the taxpayer, so they, they can always replenish their destroyed capital uh, because they are in collusion with the government. So I, my warnings, my earlier warnings, about eight years ago when I started writing about this, were about uh, you know industries such as the car makers in the United States, or the industries which have folded and went to Asia from the Western countries because they were looking for cheap labor. This was nothing more but a reflection of destruction of capital. I mean, Asian labor was always, historically, always cheaper than uh, the labor in the West. Uh, and we could coexist with uh, the Asian countries very happily because there was a division of labor, and this is the uh, well-known uh, classical economic theory that under the division of labor, each country will be able to carve out a niche for itself. Those who are good at agriculture are blessed with good climate and they can produce more uh, productively will have that those which have cheaper labor can take advantage of that. So there is a harmonious um, uh, what's the word? Symbiosis. Symbiosis between well capitalized uh, highly developed countries and not so well capitalized uh, developing countries which have other advantages. But it doesn't necessarily 
mean that you have to export jobs if you are a developed country to the uh, less developed countries because there is the symbiosis. But you see, this assumes that interest rates are fairly stable. The whole equation is upset if interest rates have a prolonged fall as they have had. And nobody studies the question. And nobody gives out warning. It's just, as I just said, it's the cry in the wilderness. And people don't pay attention. As, I, uh, as, as you mentioned in your introductory remarks, I got zero feedback from these uh, people at the <laughs> Palazzo Munda. Uh, there were Nobel Prize winners among them. There were uh, retired central bankers, uh, treasury of, uh, officers. There were even uh, Arab uh, banks, uh, representatives. There was Paul Walker, who was the architect of the high interest regime which came to uh, peak in 1981 or 82. So in other words, he is responsible for the subsequent fall because he triggered this tremendous rise in the late 1970s to, um, this is in the history of the Western countries unprecedented the, this high level of interest rates. Even before World War I it never happened. Before World War II or, or when the war was already in progress it never happened. It happened in 1979-1980 uh, because Paul Volcker who was appointed a few months earlier and he said that we'll try uh, Milton Friedman's way and just uh, make a free market in it. So this is the situation. And I am suggesting it to you that uh, uh, an understanding of where we are today is unthinkable without going deeper into this question. So I am suggesting it to you that we should look at the same problem in another way. Let's talk about depreciation. And I mean the depreciation of capital goods. Uh, producing enterprise could be car maker in the United States buys a piece of equipment. Let's assume that this is state of art and so on. Now, when, uh, when it does this, there are consequences as far as accounting uh, is concerned. The uh, value of this piece of productive equipment. Well, it could be a building, it could be a machine, a, a lathe, or, or think of any uh, machine, or more complicated machines, or an assembly line. Doesn't matter, but it costs money, so the accountant will take the value of this piece of productive equipment and puts it in the balance sheet both on the asset side and on the liability side. On the asset side this productive equipment is a plus for the company because it's expected that its contribution to the production effort will be positive and profits will be made and so on. But on the liability side, you have to enter the same amount because this value has to be 
uh, written off. And it's written off not over one year, not o over two years, but you just estimate the productive life of this piece of ex equipment and then you have to depreciate this value by annual uh, quotas. They are called depreciation quotas. Uh, this could be, there are several ways of doing that. Some, there are some industries which prefer to write it off along uh, linear model, straight line. Some would use an exponential or logarithmic uh, depreciation and there might be reasons for, uh, for picking another model. Nonetheless, some depreciation schedule will have to be adopted because Everybody knows that this piece of equipment is not going to be worth the same amount at the end of its productive life as it is at the time you install it when it's, it's still new. So there are two things here. One is the depreciation schedule, which means that every year or every quarter, as the case may be, a certain amount, the quota, is taken out of the uh, revenues of the enterprise and applied to depreciating the value. So it's a stream of payments which is necessary to accumulate the capital which is needed that when time comes to scrap this equipment then the funds will be ready to replace it without having to go out. In other words you are not making your enterprise dependent on future financial conditions because you are constantly accumulating capital which will be necessary to renew this equipment when time comes. And we know this time will come. Now that's one side of the equation. But on the other side of the equation you t we talk about amortization. So this liability which the company assumes when it installs a new piece of capital equipment, this liability will have to be amortized and that's what this whole pro process is about. Now, this is done at the time of installing the new equipment. Fine. And if the rate of interest is constant, or relatively constant, more or less, then there's no problem. No problem, because things work out smoothly. As the production equipment is subject to wear and tear, and eventually discarded, scrapped, the amount of money to buy the next one, perhaps at the higher level of state of art will be available and the, the company will prosper. But what happens if the rate of interest keeps falling for an extended period of time? That is a question which nobody asks. <coughs> but it has to be asked. Because what happens is that the depreciation schedule has to be scrapped right away. On the day the interest rate falls, it means that this stream of payment which the company set aside for amortization purposes will fall short. And by the end of the useful life of this piece of equipment, there will, the funds will not be available to replace it. So the what I call the destruction of capital here assumes a physical existence. It's not 
some theory, woolly theory, coming from the brain of some uh, foolish professors who enjoy picking uh, <laughs> the theory of well accepted accounting, uh, you know, peer principles or, or practices. So the fact is that if the rate of interest falls for an extended period of time, then the depreciation schedule, the amortization schedule become pretty well meaningless and it's always on the side of destruction of capital. In other words, the capital will not be available, the funds will not be available to renew capital when, it, when time comes. Now, another way of saying that is that the present value of, futures, of a future stream of payments discounted at a falling rate of interest is going to be lower. And I have presented this several times and there was always opposition because I, I admit this is highly non-intuitive because it's, it's almost in the genes of of everybody that if the interest rates get lower, this is a good news. Let's be happy and, uh, and forget about problems because we are going in the right direction, which is not the case. So I have been told that, well, if that's the case, the present value of future stream of payments discounted at a falling rate of interest is lower, then the reverse is also true, which means that the rising rate of interest will lead to present value of stream of payments, uh, which is higher. So in other words, while well, interest rates fall so far, but then it will have to, they will have to turn around and start rising, and that will be the opportunity for the company to recover whatever loss has been a paper loss, but it will be reversed. So I just have to say, well, look, I am not going to argue with you that if the present value of a future stream of payments is discounted at a rise in interest rate, then there is a profit. This, I, I grant you this. But the company has to be around to collect that higher interest. And the company could well go belly up in the meantime, because if the length of falling interest rate is long enough, then capital will be exhausted long before the company can enjoy. That's why Swiss Air fell out of the skies. It's true that if Swiss Air didn't fall out of the sky, then it, perhaps a reversal would have. But all highly capital in, in uh, capital intensive enterprises are exposed to this more than, than the Asian countries where the production is not that capital in, intensive. Now the airlines are among the most capital intensive enterprises which we have today and that's why the casualty rate is so high there because they have been flying with falling interest rates and never asked them to the question what consequence does it have for our capital structure? And by the time they woke up, the capital was gone and they plunged and never been able to recover. So 
I remember I've written about this when Swiss Air was still flying. I remember it very well because Ferdinand Lips was a good friend of mine. And he is unfortunately no longer with us because he died as a result of a climbing accident in the Swiss Alps. And uh, we talked about this. At that time, Swiss Air was still flying. And now, of course, people would rationalize it. Oh, Swiss Air had a, a bad accident in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and that's the cause. So they wouldn't even consider that what is at work here is a capital erosion, which, if not looked after, then will cause uh, a, a tremendous crash worse than a single airline being lost in an accident, for which, by the way, they have insurance. But there is no insurance against this under the present monetary system, which allows these wide swings in the rate of interest. So, uh, this is, these are the various contexts I put my thesis in. One is the destruction of capital in terms of capital ratios, and the other is the depreciation quotas. They both have the effect of making the problem worse, and not better. And there is nothing which would uh, remedy the situation. And what happens today is that what they call quantitative easing, that's the word, yeah, yeah, the what word. a foolish thing. <laughs> they can't call it what it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, oh, yes, they can. It, what they mean is that the interest rates should keep falling. And if uh, short-term interest rates are, they are zero, well, then let's just go to the other end of the yield curve and massage it the same way as we massage the short end and push those. They are still at 4%. Now, there's a lot of room to, to make them fall. And now, I'm not suggesting that they will always succeed doing that, but for the first time being, I think they do. So I am fully prepared for a continuation of the falling uh, interest rate so structure as far as the long term. Uh, one uh, bellwether issue is the 30 year US bonds. Now, uh, I remember during the Clinton administration, they were proudly announcing that we are phasing them out because uh, the short term interest rates are so attractive and so low that uh, it it would be foolish for the Treasury to issue 30-year 30 30-year 30 bonds, which is, of course, those who were here uh, yesterday when I explained borrowing uh, short and lending long, will realize that if you finance government operations in short-term issues, that, and this is exactly the same as borrowing short and lending long, and this has a penalty attached to it, which is that you have to keep rolling over the government debt. And there's no way to predict the financial conditions which will prevail at the time when you have to come back to the uh, bond market or the bill market or whatever market it is where you do the financing and it is quite possible, in fact almost predictable, that you will uh, have to face much worse terms uh, if you keep coming back to the market for rolling over the debt. So uh, what they presented as a wise course of action, phase out 30 year bonds, this is, 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 has a back, uh, is, is going to backfire in a way it has already backfired because they reversed that policy. They say now that actually it's a good thing to borrow uh, long term because uh, then they 
ease the pressure off on on the short at the short end. Now let's not go into these details. I'm just saying it to you that the 30-year uh, bonds are still alive and kicking. So you can follow the charts on the 30-year U.S. Treasury bond and, and see that it's in a channel and zigzagging between the upper and the lower uh, trend line. And uh, people like Bill Gross um, called the shots, the biggest bond trader in the world, you see. And uh, he makes uh, <laughs> prediction that it will break out this way, break out that way. I have followed his writings and opinion on that, and it's completely unreliable. I mean, he is just an opportunist who uh, uses uh, these uh, uh, newsletters which he puts out and uh, tries to influence them. Uh, the market sentiment. Uh, the fact is that I don't see any evidence yet that this falling trend on the 30-year U.S. Treasury bond is, has been reversed or is uh, reversal is imminent. I have not see, seen evidence. Uh, I may be wrong, but I, I think it's safer to assume that this is going to continue. I could give reasons for that. I don't know how we stand with time. I want a little discussion after that. So um, well, let me just say that because of this, that interest rates are still falling, especially if you follow the 30-year treasury, but you see the same thing if you follow the 10-year Treasury bond uh, interest. And as a consequence, I, I am one of those who, uh, who are inclined to expect deflation more than an immediate hyperinflation. This is the theoretical reason, because the uh, interest rate is going to keep going to fall, and as a consequence, the capital erosion of society is not, is not over yet. The worst is still ahead of us, and the depression is going to be probably worse than what we have seen in the 30s. This is not a happy announcement on my part. I feel I'm like Cassandra, the figure from Greek mythology. She was the princess of Troy, and she refused the love of Apollo, the god. And as a punishment, the, uh, Apollo, the god, gave her the gift of seeing, <coughs> for predicting the future, which she did. And for Troy, it was a disaster. And uh, so much so that the father, the king, Priamos, locked her up in a citadel. Mm -hmm. So she could not communicate with the people because this would uh, uh, spoil the fighting spirit. Uh, but her predictions came, came through. So th this is not a happy story. Uh, and uh, and uh, I just have to offer my apologies that I am not. Uh, please don't kill the messenger. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Yes, Professor, uh, you. Uh, I've written many papers on deflation and so on amongst your works. Can you refer us to any, please? Just so I can refresh myself. Well, you specifically have written papers on deflation. Oh, in your yes, yes. Well, this is the main one. But it had several earlier versions, and uh, the, 
the earliest version was specifically about <coughs> producing industries, not financial. Uh, but as things developed, I, I realized that the financial institutions are not exempt from capital. So what I see and what I think my contribution is to this debate is that the depression has one main cause. And all the talk about uh, subprime, uh, loose lending practices, but is, is by and large irrelevant. The one cause which you can identify in almost every single case is the erosion of capital due to the fall. And you must understand that because this is simultaneous, it's all the worse. Because, you know, normally if it's random distribution, then one firm goes under here, and after a time another firm goes down there, and it will smoothen out. So the, the society as a as an entity is not going to suffer. I mean, there will be individuals suffer here and there at a different time, but it's not a simultaneous, just like a plague or any kind of biblical punishment as, as, as God punished the Egypt, uh, Egyptians, uh, the angel of death went from door to door and the first uh, born son died in every family or something like that. Because normally it's random distribution, the statistical um, uh, fact. But what is happening here is that all this takes place simultaneously without anybody paying attention. So when capital is finally disappeared, then the day of reckoning comes. And, and I think this is criminal to expose society to such great suffering. I mean, we know the 1930s was bad. And you can look up the interest rate charts in the 1930s and you will see that you can verify what I'm saying. So why didn't they analyze this? Why didn't they say that, look, the Great Depression had an identifiable cause, the erosion of the rate of interest. So uh, all I'm saying is that uh, the depression is caused by essentially by one single cause. Let me ask you, is the flip side of that that continuously declining interest rates encourages people to go out and buy stuff and spend money on things that are not really uh, productive? They're more, they encourage them to consume rather than produce? Um, I think the question is, is that is the intent or the flip side, another consequence of falling interest rates is the stimulus of the economy, which causes money to be cheaper and purchases to renew, buying pressure to uh, resume. Well, I would say if you had a guarantee that interest rates have fallen and will fall no more, this might be the case. But is there any sign that interest rates have bottomed out? I don't think there are. I mean, they keep talking about um, uh, what was the word I used before? The, the quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. It's like closing the window. <laughs> I mean, does it encourage misallocation of effort and, um, you know, it encourages consumption rather than production, basically. Uh, now, uh, this is very interesting because uh, there have been studies about artificial lowering of interest. In particular, the Austrian school has a, a very 
considerable uh, body of, of research on this and I am I'm quite sympathetic with it and what the Austrians say is that as the interest rate is artificially lowered by the banking system or the government or both because what is happening is a conspiracy between the two uh, then the stimulus which you talk about is given to start investments in those things which have no economic justification. Yeah. I, mean, I, have, I have a great sympathy with that. But, there's a but. Let me ask the question, how is it that this has been going on, according to the Austrian school for several hundred years, but let's just say 100 years, and businessmen have not learned that all signals coming from the banks and the government are full signals and adjust their investment policies accordingly. In other words, there is a weak point in the Austrian theory. And I'm not dismissing it on block because it has valuable content as well. But it does not answer the question, are all businessmen stupid and they are falling for this cheap trick that the government has quantitative easing, so let's go and invest. This is the time. Quantitative, long-lived quantitative easing. And look back in history and see that all this effort ended in disaster. Well, I was thinking about this about 10 years ago and I said, I, I, I'm not going to work on the assumption that all businessmen are stupid. So I have to look for some explanation which will clarify this, that there's more than that to it. That businessmen fall for this artificial stimulus and, and they commit their funds for stupid uh, projects. Let's go a little bit deeper. And as I was thinking about it, I came up with this. And, and you see, I constantly ask myself the question, how come that other people didn't think of this? That falling interest rates are poison. They are not medicine. They are poison in any dose. So, you know, I, I, I fully realize that this is counterintuitive. But I think that is the real reason. So, I give due respect to the Austrians, but that is not the final answer that they, they provide for depressions. And, um, businessmen are fooled by lower interest and then they overinvest and uh, then there's overproduction and prices start falling and etc. I mean this is all worked out. But that is not the final answer. There's a lot of truth in it, but not the final answer. Yes. Right. Uh, as I understand it, um, you had some criticism of the Volcker because he had to raise the interest rates as many other countries did at that time. But I thought that was to conquer runaway inflation. And I agree that constantly declining interest rates, as you've indicated, are destructive. But surely something had to be done for the uh, very large bubble in inflation at that time. In the UK, we had over 20% inflation. And interest rates had to be uh, jacked up in order to conquer this. I, I think there is a lot of truth in this. I, I remember, because I was around and I was watching very carefully what was happening in 1979, just after the appointment of Paul Walker. And I expected that hyperinflation would take place right there and then. 
1979. Not just the gold price, but oil. I remember sugar went to 75 cents a pound. 75. It used to be a fraction of a cent or two cents at most. You know, and even that was a subsidized because the the American sugar uh, mills, sugar producers had to be protected against the cheap. Sugar. So on the world market, there were two prices for sugar: the world price and the U.S. price. And the U.S. price was as low as two three cents, and the world price could have been a fraction of one cent. You see, so we went to. The world price went to 75 cents. So, you know, and, and these are not isolated yeah. instances. Coffee went crazy, wheat went crazy, everything, practically everything, uh, went crazy in the late 1970s, early 1980s. The gold price was relatively modest. <laughs> It went up only 20 folds. <laughs> well, what is that in, com in comparison with the sugar price? <laughs> well, well, silver was not as modest as, as uh, gold, because silver went to what? $50 a, a month. So I, I s s expected hyperinflation. Zimbabwe style, there was, I don't know if there was a Zimbabwe around then, but certainly hyperinflation was nothing new in the dictionary of economics and life. Stagflation in the UK. Yeah. So, uh, Paul Volcker came in as the savior of the system. He did say, but at what price? Nobody, nobody asked the question about exit strategy. So, Paul Walker is the savior. He created a high interest environment. But what about the exit strategy? It has to come down. And if it does, what consequences will, will it have? Well, Paul Walker did save the banks because the, the American banks were all bankrupt as a consequence of the high, in, and why? Because seesaw, if interest rates go up, bond prices go down. But the bond, the most important holders of the bonds were the banks. That's, that was the asset in their balance sheet. And just imagine what happens when interest rates go to double digit or high teens. I mean, the 30-year U.S. Treasury bond went above 16%. Now, in rough terms, this means that the balance sheet of the banks fell to one quarter of the original value. So capital was wiped out. You see, the, the, the seesaw can hit you whether it goes up or it goes down. The only answer is stable resources. And that is the secret of the gold standard. It's not that it will stabilize prices, because it cannot and it shouldn't. But it can stabilize interest rates, and history proves that this is possible, and it did work, and uh, the prosperity of the 19th century, to a large extent, is owed to the gold standard and the stable interest rate structure. Yes. Yes, sir. Professor, thanks very much for your presentation so far. Well, I assume you're talking about real interest rates as opposed to nominal interest rates <coughs> when you talk about the deflationary effect. And uh, what my question is, is that uh, quantitative easing occurs and the uh, <coughs> inflation is used to um, make real interest rates below zero. As, as you suggested, we've, they've got to try and put interest rate, make a continue to try and push interest rates lower. Once it gets to zero, that becomes harder. Inflation can be used to uh, make that happen and make real interest rates below zero. Could uh, could it be that we are uh, head for an inflationary environment rather than a deflationary environment? 
Well, I must start by saying that I am not a follower of this theory which distinguishes between real and uh, nominal interest rates. This is completely artificial. I mean, sure, if you create an inflationary uh, environment, then you uh, <laughs> invite this kind of theorizing, but to my mind, this is completely empty. Uh, really what I am talking about is not so much the actual level of interest rates, but the differential quotient, so rate of change, you see. So what I'm talking about is that if the rate of change of the interest rate, whether real or nominal, or you can create a dozen different interest rates, um, according to your taste or inclination, uh, which is just playing to the hand of the government. And then, you know, God created inflation, so we have to distinguish between real and nominal interest rates. That's how the world is created. That's, uh, uh, there's nothing we can do about it, because we can do nothing about tectonic uh, movements and earthquakes and what have you. So I'm not talking about the actual level of the rate of interest. I'm talking about the differential quotient. So if the differential quotient is negative, then you have capital destruction. Now if it's positive, you have other uh, problems which I haven't touched because what can you do in 45 minutes? So uh, I, I, I just can't carry this discussion any further. That, uh, I, I don't think it's, it's productive to make that distinction between nominal and real interest rates. I, I have done a lot of work on the rate of interest. I've defined it, but you don't find in my work, uh, any mention of real interest rate. I, I just don't want to get involved in, in this type of theorizing. Yes? Just, just, just one question. Uh, the, the business of business being being too stupid to, to sort of notice that interest rates are going down and the place you know, that we often sort of concern. Uh, I mean, one, one of the questions that raises in my mind is how are we capable of measuring the number of businessmen that quietly leave the field? And I mean, maybe they're the ones buying part of that 160,000 tonnes of gold that's a bit hard to account for. Is that a, is that a reasonable question? I, and he's asking the question of maybe there are some businessmen who understand about capital destruction and they're leaving business altogether. Well, uh, obviously. Well, all those American producers, I mean, there was a, a flourishing TV manufacturing in the United States. Flourish, uh, uh, tape, tape recorders were invented in the United States. The first big industry. They, they were all there. And now it's all gone. And this is exactly what happened. So uh, I, I sympathize with this. But the fact still is that we have to explain. And these are individual businessmen. Now we are talking about the, the community of businessmen, industrial leaders. And I don't think they, as a as a community, they are aware of what's going on. Individuals may have made the right decision, and they did. When I first um, heard you talk about the destruction of capital caused by falling interest rates last year, that I put that one aside because I understood everything else, but that one was a little, a little too counterintuitive for me at the time. But, you know, now it makes perfect 
sense to me. And I mean, I'm, I'm an actuary and I'm a chartered financial analyst. I can read financial statements and I can, uh, you know, uh, but the idea that you, that depreciation schedule should be reset when interest rates every time, change. Every time that it falls. Is, is nothing short of, you know, brilliant because it's, it's so obvious that it should happen but we have nobody does no, nobody why doesn't it so it gives everybody the illusion they've got assets on the balance sheet that they don't have <laughs> yeah and which anyway <laughs> you you ask you ask why why is it that businessmen don't understand this or i i think i'll just like to volunteer a suggestion is that everybody's focused on today this reporting season as opposed to the future and therefore that's why you know the short termism that exists. Well, that's a possible explanation but perhaps not the only one. No. I think I think our whole university education is cockeyed. Mm -hmm. It's it's just off focus because economists actuaries, financial accountants, are taught the wrong thing. And I am not suggesting that it's an accident. <laughs> it's, it's in the interest of this unholy alliance between the government and the banking system. You see? I mean, there is no sound way of banking if the interest rate is allowed to fluctuate the way it has ever since 1971. If you look at the interest rate chart, it was fairly stable before, forget about the 30s, but in 71 it started wide, the widest swing. There is no way to construct a sound banking system under these conditions. I'm putting my reputation online. There is no way to do that. And that is completely unacceptable to the government, to the bank. And of course, they call the shots, they pay the uh, research grants and so on, and if I apply for a research grant, please uh, uh, support my research because I want to prove it. <laughs> I'll be laughed out of the universities and everything. So, but uh, you, your point is well taken. I mean, sure, that's a possible explanation, but perhaps not the only one. I'll give, I'll give two others. I think, I think you're right. I think if you look at CEO terms, you know, they, they don't work in companies for 20 years. They don't work 10 years max, they work five. So they don't think that far out. But I think, to me, the other, I think the problem that we're mistaking is because you're using this word, which is businessman, which has now turned into manager and shareholder. They're different now. And this guy is investing this person's money. It's not his money. He doesn't care about this. Hmm. He's only here for 10 years or five years. And these people, <coughs> why don't they see their destruction of capital? It's because there's always new suckers. There's always someone who's, I'm now 30, 30 years old, I've got some money I want to invest, I don't know anything about parts, I don't see history, I don't study any of this stuff. And some new you know, airline started up and gave me this great story. You know, and I don't look back to the whole airline industry or with continuous capital raises. What about the directors of the company? Well the directors are just the same as the managers. 
not necessarily. Oh, okay. Because yes. I'm yes. saying that's an agency. Yes. The management of an agency where the person yes. that. Now, there is a conspiracy. Yes. Yes. It's not so much a conspiracy <coughs> system. The manager's interests are not the same as the shareholders. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's the split. It's the split. It's that split that's occurred. And that's what is probably part of the motivation. And it was always split, but there was the board of directors which. Was supposed to supposed to the shareholders. Yeah. yeah. So the management could be fired in okay. principle and in practice, but it hardly ever happens to. It them. does. That's right. Because you never know, institutionalize sharing. Management. So individual management shareholders. hires directors now. Hmm? It's the management who hires the directors. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, they're yeah. inbred and incestuous, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. they're selected for yeah. their pliability and go along ability. Yeah. For institutional investors, part of the game, they're more aligned up here. They they, they will be the chairman as the CEO. But the, <laughs> the operating directors of most companies I've ever looked at are in bed with the CEO and the chairman, and if, and if they cause any problem, they kick yeah. them out. That's the way it goes. I have just another slant on the theory of the uh, the businessmen carrying on as if they're stupid and naive. I don't think it's quite like that. I mean, since 1913 in the States, the Fed came in and artificially set the interest rates and has done so ever since. It's a political game. They're not set by the free market as the Austrian school would desire. Therefore, a bit like the investment bankers said three, four years ago, when the music's playing, you've got to get up and dance. They said that. They didn't see any other game in town. So when money's being offered free, when there's excess liquidity, they soak it up and they don't care how bad the projects are because of the difference between ownership and control. They're building an empire. It doesn't have to be excessively profitable, but it's nice to be excessively big because it gives them lots of power. You can only solve this by going back to the free market setting the interest rates, which is the Austrian school. And I totally subscribe to that. I think the uh, there's question a between the, didn't that cash for clunkers show us that if you give people money for nothing or for low, they'll take it. I mean, that's kind of like, but I'm just wondering whether this equates to the businessmen as well. Mm -hmm. Without doing any of the leap to see what you've referred to here is that by doing that in this declining environment, they're just blowing their feet off I'm slowly. Sorry, sorry. And they won't be around on the switch when the deal goes down. They'll have taken the chute and parachuted into another little operation. Mm -hmm. And Let's start the process. Any other questions? Yes. Just to comment, um, by Aeschylus, ostensibly writing about Cassandra, now my prophecies will no longer be looking through a veil like a newly wet bride. Rather, you may expect that it will sweep down from the sunrise like a bright fresh wind, so that it will break upon the beach, so to speak, a wave of sorrow far greater than this one. No longer will you receive my message as a riddle. Now, I hope, for the sake of all our families, that the Professor's vindication will be deferred and the Professor preserved for a long while yet. 